Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm sorry, still don't have your first papers back. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Um, are there questions about anything like that? Or about the second paper assignment? Um, we'll say, okay, so I'm going to start talking about Rousseau. Uh, Jean-Jacques, Jean-Jacques, <laughs> as if I know French, Rousseau. Actually, that's an important point. Um, this is the, uh, this is the only text in this course that wasn't originally written in English, and um, I don't really know French, so, I mean, French isn't that different from English, actually, so, like, you know, you can kind of look at the original and see what it says, but still, <laughs> um, that's something to keep in mind. Also, I mean, that also means that if people are using different translations, you shouldn't be surprised if they say different things, because uh, philosophy is hard to translate. Um, but, all right. In any case, so let me just uh, first give some perspective on what time period we're talking about now. Um, so Hobbes' dates were 1588 to 1679, and Locke was 1632. 1704. By, by the way, as writing this down, I realized that the question I was wondering about a few times ago, like how old was Locke when Hobbes died or whatever, actually because Hobbes lived a long time, uh, Locke was actually already pretty old when Hobbes died. Um, however, um, Leviathan was published in 1651. So it wasn't when Locke was a child, but when he was, what is that, 19, I guess. Uh, anyway, in the second treatise was not published until 1689. So after 10 years after Hobbes died. So I think it's still pretty much true what I said, that even though they're opponents, they weren't like directly arguing with each other. At least, in other words, like, I don't know that Hobbes ever responded to something Locke said against him. I could be wrong about that, though. Anyway, so, and Rousseau now is a bigger skip. Right, Rousseau wasn't born until 1712. He died in 1778. And the discourse that is the reading for today, the discourse on inequality, was published in 1754. Um, so it's actually, you know, uh, a larger jump from Locke to Rousseau than from Hobbes to Locke. I mean, besides the fact also that we're jumping from England to France. Um, all right. I don't have anything else to say about that, though, at least not at the moment. I just wanted to point it out. Um, and then... Uh, as usual, I'll try to say what I can to introduce Rousseau as a person. Um, he actually had a really wild life, uh, which is pretty uh, impossible to summarize. If you're interested, you can read The Confessions, which is maybe his most famous book, which is an autobiography. Um, 
but uh, he was born in, in Geneva, which at the time was basically an independent city-state. I mean, I guess it was it was somehow federated with Switzerland, but uh, um, he was born in Geneva, but he practically never lived in Geneva. Um, so he traveled all over Switzerland, France, and Italy, um, and uh, uh, towards the end of his life, he stayed with Hume in Scotland. Um, but oftentimes he traveled all over Europe by walking, actually. <laughs> um, and he did all kinds of things before he became an author. Um, that is, before he started writing, he wrote both philosophy and like novels. <laughs> um, but before that, he tried uh, engraving. He was the secretary to an ambassador. He was a botanist assistant. He tried being a music teacher, um, a number of other things. Most of these things he didn't do very well. <laughs> um, he, he converted to Catholicism after he left Geneva. Geneva was the capital of Calvinism. Uh, he, after he left Geneva, he converted to Catholicism, but later, much later, he converted back to Calvinism. Um, and <laughs> uh, I don't know if I should go into the... I want to go into these details, even though I don't really have time for it, just to give you a, a sense of what kind of person we're talking about here, uh, especially because you might not realize it from reading his stuff. So he had two main relationships with women in his life. The first was with Francois Louis de Warrens. I don't know how you pronounce that, actually. Uh, but she was an independent uh, woman, like living on her own means she was 13 years older than him um he was like uh she basically like let him live in her house <laughs> um and uh he called her maman <laughs> he called her like mommy <laughs> that was his first big relationship and then his second one was uh therese levasseur who was a poor seamstress and he never officially married her, but he lived with her for many years, um, and they have five children, and all of the five children were immediately given up to a quote-unquote foundling hospital upon being born. Um, um, uh, meanwhile, in his major work on education, which is a kind of novel slash philosophical work called Emile. Um, that was published in 1762, by the way. So in Emile, he argues that women should nurse their own children and that men should teach, should teach their own sons. And I guess also their daughters. That's a little bit less clear. But uh, um, he also argues that girls' education should be completely different from boys' education, which uh, it, this is also in Emile. So we'll see Wollstonecraft's disgust with that position. <laughs> um, but meanwhile, I mean, uh, as like many people pointed out, even uh, contemporaries, that uh, like once it came out that he had all these children that he basically gave up for adoption, it was kind of like, an inconsistency between what he was arguing for in Emile and what he actually did. Basically, yeah, his life was kind of weird and screwed up, <laughs> I guess you, you could say. Um, he also, at some point, he pretended to be a composer. Like, he, you know, he came into a town and said, oh, yeah, I can compose stuff. So they asked him to compose something, and then he was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know how, but later he actually became a composer and he composed an opera, which you can uh, actually still hear if you're interested. To me, it sounds like every other French opera. Uh, but in any case, um, and I guess one more thing to add, which was that eventually he got in trouble for some things he had written in Emile and in the social contract. Um, uh, mostly but because of the religious implications um, of things he wrote in Emile and the social contract. And he had to flee various places. Um, 
that was actually why he at one point ended up with Hume in Scotland. Uh, at the same time, he did, however, uh, inconveniently, he started to develop these paranoid delusions that all kinds of people who actually weren't out to get him were, including Hume. So <laughs> the end of his life was kind of unpleasant. Um, and that's what I have to say about that. Um, um, oh, someone asked, what time was this relative to French history? Well, the French Revolution was 1789. I don't think I got that wrong. I'm just giving the date off the top of my head, though. So uh, I haven't looked in Wikipedia <laughs> lately. <laughs> yeah, the French Revolution was 1789. So, it's, so he died before that, but not long before that. So it was the period um, leading up to that. And I guess... Uh, yeah, it's controversial, I think, how much influence his writings had on the, the fact that the French Revolution took place and the course that it took. It certainly had some effect. Um, but yeah, he wasn't personally involved. He wasn't alive anymore. Um, uh, any other questions? It is worth reading the Confessions. It's really interesting, and Emile, for that matter. I thought about teaching a course on philosophy of education when I read that, but I don't know. Anyway, not now. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so if you did the reading for today, I'm sure you you noticed what I'm about to say, which is that he's a very different kind of reader writer from either Hobbes or Locke even though he's clearly responding to both of them, and sometimes he responds to them by name, but even when he doesn't, he's thinking about them. Um, but um, especially in this work, the contrast, in the social contract is a little bit closer to Hobbes and Locke type of thinking, but especially in this work, you don't find a lot of careful definitions, uh, neat little arguments divided up into sections, um, uh, it's harder, maybe even impossible, to construct a huge consistent system of politics um, or political philosophy. And um, in the case of both Hobbes and Locke, it's not just that, right? It's connected to their epistemology and psychology and all kinds of other theories. So, I mean, Rousseau doesn't, um, doesn't really even attempt to erect a big consistent structure like that. Um, sometimes it seems that different things he says, sometimes even in the same work, are kind of said in different moods. <laughs> um, although I don't think that's the whole issue, but that, that's part of the issue. Um, and also, I guess I would say, uh, um, unlike Hobbes or Locke, he uh, has a tendency to be self-undermining or self-critical. Um, um, it's so, I mean, that raises a general question about how seriously to take his various arguments because he doesn't necessarily always give the feeling that he's entirely satisfied with them. Um, or even with the whole enterprise, right? So like if you look on page 50, um, now, I don't have a way of referring to this text by like paragraph numbers or anything. So if you don't have the same edition, um, I'm not sure how to tell you how to find passages. But um, if nature has destined us to be healthy, wait, did I switch to the, yeah, I did, okay. If nature has, de has destined us to be healthy, I almost dare to affirm that the state of reflection is a state contrary to nature, 
and that the man who meditates is a depraved animal. Um, in other words, um, Rousseau is saying, and I, yeah, I guess I say self, self undermining and self critical, but not in a like, not in the way I always do when I stop in the middle of a lecture and like, wait, is that right? <laughs> in a way where he actually is signaling that if he is right about what he's saying, then the activity he himself is engaged in is not natural or healthy. Um, right? So, I mean, I don't think you can imagine Hobbes or Locke saying that. Um, it's a different kind of, um, different and perhaps, uh, later, like moving into things that will be more, co more common later in the modern period. Um, so, uh, um, so, uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, there are more issues about how to read these, this book or more complicated issues about how to read it than I think there are for the other authors that we've seen so far. On, you know, on the other hand, um, there still actually are a lot of powerful or interesting arguments in it. And even more than that, I guess I would say like surprising new ways of looking at things. Um, such that the problems seem to be changed from what it was before. Um, and it's also the case that Rousseau was highly respected and influential on some very systematic thinkers, including Kant. Um, uh, Kant said that Rousseau was to morals what Newton was to physics, basically. <laughs> so, um, um, So I guess, you know, when I talk about it, I am still going to try to focus on, you know, to the extent possible on the position and the arguments and whatever. But, uh, but in the, in the back of our minds, at least has to be the question uh, always has to be a question about, you know, what Rousseau thinks about this kind of argument, I guess I would say. Um, what he thinks it's good for and what he thinks it's not good for, why he's making it, what he wants us to do with it, etc. Okay. Um, are there questions about that? I don't know what questions there would be, but. All right. Um, Where does Rousseau fall into the um, camp of like empiricism or rationalism? Or autism. Yeah, so again, that's, you know, that's something that's hard to answer. He didn't, you know, like I said, he didn't try to set up a system where he, so, I mean, I'm going to mention some places in here where he seems to be following Descartes. Um, but he didn't write like his own treatise on epistemology or, uh, you know, you just have to go by um, things he says here and there. Um, so, in other words, it's not for certain that he really settles or, or wants to give it out that he settled on one of those things. I think. Um, um, So, um, yeah, I mean, you can gather some things from the what, what he says that people would know in the state of nature, but it's, again, there's, as I'm going I'm to get to that, I hope there's a lot of questions about what he's talking about when he talks about stuff like that. Um, so anyway, yeah, maybe I should get more in the details and some, and the answer to the extent I can give it might start to come out. Um, so, okay, right. So this is called, the full title of this work is Discourse on the Origin and Foundations of Inequality Among Men. Um, 
So, uh, remembering again that I don't, and you know, French is like the most embarrassing language not to know because if you don't know it, then you don't, you don't know how to pronounce anything <laughs> correctly. So, um, but, uh, but the French word for, for man is om, I guess that's pronounced. And um, this is uh, actually, um, as I understand it, pretty much shares the ambiguities of the English word man. Unlike what I was claiming before about like say the Latin word homo, right? So this is both the word for human being and the word for man versus woman and moreover it's also i mean and the word man can be used like this way in english too it's like the word for like when you're really a man that means you're like honorable or whatever right so i mean and thoreau i mean thoreau rousseau <laughs> plays with this um right 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 near the beginning he says uh it is of man that I have to speak. This is on page 45 in my edition. It is of man that I have to speak. And the question I am, examining, I am examining indicates to me that I am going to be speaking to men, for such questions are not proposed by those who are afraid to honor the truth. Right? So right there he switched from man meaning presumably human being to man meaning uh, someone who's not afraid to honor the truth or at least man implying that. Um, and uh, um, I think, you know, he's certainly aware of that ambiguity and deliberately using it in that passage. What, for what effect, I'm not sure, but he's certainly it's deliberate. Um, it also seems like, especially given that he did think a lot about relationships between men and women, um, that uh, he must be aware of the way he plays with the other ambiguity as well. So, I mean, there's lots of cases where he'll say men, and it's clear that he means human beings, right? Because he'll say something like, well, man, you know, has this advantage over other animals that the mother can nurse the child while walking around. Right, so their man obviously included women. But on the other hand, he'll also th say things like, in the state of nature, man needed nothing but food, drink, a female, and rest. <laughs> right, so at that point, of course, he's using man to mean man versus woman. Um, and like I said, I feel like, not that I have a theory to account for all the uses of it, but uh, or but I really understand what he's doing with this, but I feel like he must be deliberately doing something with it. Um, so, of course, that just makes it all the more difficult to talk about this text, right? Like, trying to decide when you should... Uh, kind of correct it and change it from man to human being and when uh, you would lose track of what he's saying if you do that. Um, anyway, that's, uh, again, I don't know exactly what to do with that, but I'm just, I'm just um, putting a notice that that's going on here. Um, um, Right, I pointed out that in Hobbes, there's 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 some inconsistency like that in the in Leviathan, but in the in his Latin work and in the Latin translation of Leviathan, he sorts it out. Um, so whereas there is no Latin, I don't think Rousseau's Latin was very good actually. Um, anyway, he didn't write anything in Latin, so. Um, Okay, so that's kind of all long digression. Um, now let me get to talking about what this, this book is about. So this is an answer posed to a prize question proposed by the Academy of Dijon, uh, 
right? So they had this thing where where they would like propose a prize for whoever gives the best answer to this question, and every you know, like people would from all over would write essays, and then they would give the prize to the best one. I think uh, Rousseau won the prize, uh, I believe. Um, so, uh, and the question was, what is the origin of inequality, um, inequality among men, and is it authorized by the law of nature? So that's the question that the whole book is supposed to be about. What is the origin of inequality among men, that is, among human beings, I guess, and is it authorized by the law of nature? So, um, yeah, I mean, r actually, right away, I don't know whether you sh it's really right to say among human beings, according to Rousseau. Um, I mean, he says something about, uh, in the reading for today, he says something about, um, like, and this is a weird inversion of what we would likely say about this. He says that for that standards of beauty by which um, men, and now he means men as opposed to women, I think, pre prefer one mate over another, were invented by women in order to like um, create their empire and allow the, the sex that should obey to command. Right, so there he's like saying that uh, men and women are not act naturally equal, and that the and that you know the fact that women have gained some control over men is a, is like a degenerate symptom of having left the state of nature. Uh, although on the other hand, it's not like you can understand the way he describes the state of nature. It can't be there that the man would command and the woman would obey. Because he explains that they don't even stay together. and So, yeah, so this is the first example of it's not, it's not easy to put together everything he says into one point of view. <laughs> um, uh, in any case, um, um, so Rousseau looks at this question and he says, um, the first thing he says is, well, I'm going to distinguish between natural inequality and political or moral inequality. Natural inequality is like, you know, some human beings are stronger than others, some are taller, or some are older, some are younger, right? So he's not, not necessarily permanent causes of inequality, but natural causes of inequality um, in the sense that uh, they aren't created by any human institution, these, these sources of inequality. And he says, uh, well, I'm sure you're not asking about this, Academy of Dijon, <laughs> right? I'm sure you're not asking about this because it's clear what the origin of this is. It's natural. <laughs> um, so he says, I'm going to take it that the question is about the origin of political or moral inequality, which is the type of inequality that depends on a kind of convention among human beings. Um, Right, or as he puts it, uh, it depends on a kind of convention and is established or at least authorized by the consent of men. So the question is, what's the origin of that? Now, um, a possible answer, of course, would be natural inequality is the origin of political or moral inequality. 
right? Could you, this is... Professor, repeat the quote, if you don't mind? Oh, yeah. I could even show you the book if, if that would help. Uh, it's on page 45. Um, um, It's right near the beginning. This latter type of inequality consists in the different privileges enjoyed by some at the expense of others. Oh wait, I, sh I just started too late. Uh, moral or political inequality. It depends on a kind of convention and is established or at least authorized by the consent of men. This latter type of inequality consists in different privileges enjoyed by some at the expense of others, such as being richer, more honored, more powerful than they, or even causing themselves to be obeyed by them. That's the kind of inequality we're talking about. Right, so as I was about to say, um, one answer to that question would be, well, uh, it's political or moral inequality arises from natural inequality. And in that case, I guess you would say it is authorized by the law of nature. I mean, I guess it depends what you meant by the law of nature and how it authorizes things. But in any case, I mean, this is a theory that uh, Plato at least, uh, whether Plato himself is really behind it or not, but, but Socrates and other characters raise it in various dialogues and Aristotle definitely argues for it, at least in part, that, um, you know, the reason some people rule and some people are slaves is, or at least should be, that some people are naturally rulers and others are naturally slaves. Um, so, uh, um, um, I mean, that's a very straightforward version of it, but there can be like kind of uh, lesser versions of it where you say that, you know, in the state of nature, some people were stronger and um, on the whole, those people ended up in charge and therefore their descendants ended up in charge or whatever. So, um, um, this is not really Locke's or Hobbes' opinion, right? Locke and Hobbes say that in a state of nature, people, natural inequality was not so great as to lead to political or moral inequality, right? You remember that was one of the first points that Hobbes made about how the the, in the, about the state of nature, that in the state of nature, even the weakest is strong enough to kill the strongest. Oh, so are you saying, well, I mean, I'm not saying it. <laughs> Sorry, but Aristotle is saying it. <laughs> yeah, so someone's asking in the chat. So are you saying that because people are born with different traits, qualities, talents, etc., those differences are what lead to political and moral inequalities, right? Yeah, that would be the theory. Now, um, what Rousseau says about that theory is, um, it's actually back on that same page I was just showing you, page 45. He says, um, um, so, I mean, further up, he says, you know, right, oh, here we go. There is still less point in asking whether there would not be some essential connection between the two inequalities. For that would amount to asking whether those who command are necessarily better than those who obey, and whether strength of body or mind, wisdom or virtue, are always found in the same individuals in proportion to power or wealth. And, and his response to that question is, perhaps this is a good question for slaves to discuss within earshot of their masters, but it is not suitable for reasonable and free men who seek the truth. Right? So he's saying, like, it is just obviously not true that the people who are in command are always naturally better in some way than the people who are obeying. Um, 
neither like physically stronger nor mentally more capable nor more virtuous and he says like um you could only maintain that you would only maintain that if you yourself were a slave and you thought that your master was listening in to the conversation. Um, now, what that means about Aristotle, I'm not sure what he thinks about, what he thinks is going on there. Um, but in any case, so um, he's completely ruling out any answer like that. Um, so, of course, this makes the question difficult right? That is, we're saying, yeah, we started off with certain natural inequalities, but they didn't lead to political or moral inequality in any direct way. So how did there come to be political or moral inequality? Because there obviously is now. Um, um, so, I mean, you know, uh, we know that Hobbes and Locke already have some kind of answers to that, but uh, they may not be very satisfactory answers. But in any case, um, Rousseau starts to give his answer in the same way they start to give theirs. He says, well, so if we want to know how we got from the state where there were only natural inequalities, to a state where there are all these political or moral inequalities, we have to ask, um, what was that state before there were any political or moral inequalities like? Right, so that is, um, he's gonna address this question of the origin. So it's, it's this part that we're talking about for the, for the moment. Somehow it's going to have to get back to answering this part. But for the moment, we're just, this part's hard enough. Where did it come from at all? And he says, well, in order to figure out where it came, where it came from, we have to um, look at how things would be in a natural state where it hadn't happened yet. Right? So we're going to look at the state of nature. So, um, um, and part one of the discourse, which is the reading for today, is all about that. It's all about the state of nature. Only in part two does he start to explain how <coughs> human beings could have left the state of nature and the way that process resulted, among other things, in inequality. Okay, so... Um, uh, but, you know, just as the difference between Hobbes and Locke on the state of nature turned out, in a sense, to contain the explanation for all the other differences, right? So, I mean, before looking at the explanation of inequality, um, to understand what kind of uh, answer Rousseau will give to that in the end, you have to, we have to figure out what he means by the state of nature and what he thinks the state of nature is like. So um, I think uh, there are two important differences between what Rousseau is, Rousseau's It would be nice, to, but I think probably um, too neat to try to distinguish between two questions. One would be, what does Rousseau mean by state of nature? And another would be, what does he think the state of nature was like? Um, but somehow in his disagreement with Hobbes and Locke, these two things are combined in a way that's a little hard to get apart. But in any case, so there's two major differences let's say, between Rousseau on the one hand and Hobbes and Locke on the other hand about what, we're, what we should say about the state of nature. Let me put it that way. So the first difference is, I guess, that um, Hobbes and Locke agree that the state of nature is bad because... Uh, 
in the state of nature, we don't have nice things. <laughs> that is, we don't have civilization. Um, right? So Hobbes and Locke both take it for granted that savages are miserable and unhappy. Now, I mean, um, to say, uh, the argument, I mean, that's relevant not because they think all or most savages are actually in the state of nature, right? That is, the people they call savages mostly um, are living in political societies of some kind or another. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I think it's true according to them that if you were in the state of nature, you would definitely be savages, <laughs> right? So, um, so the implication holds that way and not the other way. So if you were in the state of nature, you would be savages, which means, you know, of course, it, you know, it doesn't mean that you would be really like mean and nasty. Uh, Hobbes thinks you would be, but that's not the meaning of the word. It just, it means that you, you, um, wouldn't be civilized. So you wouldn't have a city, basically, right? Um, in other words, like, uh, um, a prerequisite for actually having a city, a civitas, is in the, in the strict sense, like urban culture and all the things that go with it, like writing and so on, um, a prerequisite for that is to have a civitas in the sense of a commonwealth, a civil society, a civil, the civil state as opposed to the state of nature. So therefore, um, the people in the state of nature are necessarily savages, and uh, Hobbes and Locke agree that savages are unhappy because they don't have all the things we have. Um, um, and it's supposed to be, I think, kind of obvious. Um, so, and therefore, according to Hobbes and Locke, if you find yourself in the state of nature, you have a good reason for getting out of it. Namely, I mean, of course, one reason, according to Hobbes, at least, is the constant fear of violent death. But remember, even according to Hobbes, that's only part of the reason. A big part of the reason is that you want agriculture and manufacture and all the things that you can't have because you're stuck in the state of nature. So, um, um, whereas Rousseau... Um, thinks the state of nature is not so bad. And although it may not be the best possible state, it's probably, at least in many ways, better than civilization. Better than full civilization. Or at least it's very hard to have a civilization that's an improvement on the state of nature. He may think that Sparta is that. We'll see more about Sparta coming up. But, uh, but certainly the state we're in now, Rousseau thinks, is in many ways much worse than a state of nature. Okay, so, um, uh, so of course, you know, that's going to um, make it even less clear why you would leave the state of nature if it's not really so bad. And um, moreover, actually the end product of having all these things that we have, Rousseau basically takes the position that um, it's a net loss, right? Like, so that what he says about medicine is that um, medicine the advance of medicine can't keep up with all the new diseases that the advance of civilization causes. <laughs> um, I don't think that's really true, but I mean, I don't know. I, you could argue that even now, I guess. But, um, 
of course, uh, medicine they had didn't work very well, so you could argue it much more easily. <laughs> um, right? So anyway, um, um, so that's one difference. But and another difference is that now this is not exactly the same between Hobbes and Locke, but basically. Um, Definitely for Hobbes, and at least sometimes for Locke, the state of nature is an abstraction. It's um, an abstraction in, I guess you might say, the strict sense of like taking the way human beings are as we know them, and then like abstracting away from all the things that are due to uh, covenants or consent or whatever, and you're left with a state that you can call the state of nature. So, um, um, so that's why in Hobbes especially, I mean, even in Hobbes, I pointed out there's some issue about like when he's thinking about the original state of nature of just like individuals scattered around versus, but like when Hobbes confronts someone asking, has there ever been a state of nature? He says, well, sure, yeah, all sovereigns now are in a state of nature with respect to each other, right? So the state of nature is not as it at least seems to be explicitly in Rousseau, um, a historical period. The time before Civil, civil society was invented. Um, right, so I mean, I guess I, to describe it another way, this, you know, according to Hobbes and Locke, the state of nature is like whenever there is no judge on earth between you, you be, between you and someone else, you're in a state of nature with respect to each other. Um, right? Whenever the only way you can settle your difference ultimately is, as Locke says, to appeal to heaven, that is, to fight, <laughs> then uh, you're in a state of nature with respect to each other. But Rousseau, at least here in part one of the discourse, is um, not talking about something that could happen any time there are certain circumstances, like there's no judge on earth between you and whatever. It's something that happened once a long, long time ago. Um, as I said, Locke is a little bit intermediate between Hobbes and Rousseau in this respect. Locke, you know, brings in certain for important purposes, brings in certain features of the state of nature that seem to be historical, like the population was small and stuff like that. Um, but he doesn't tell a long story about human history the way Rousseau does. Um, so, I mean, this means that Rousseau has a harder version of the question that Locke and Hobbes both take on, which is, um, so has there ever been a state of nature, really? And, um, you know, he can't answer, he can't answer, or he shouldn't be able to answer. I mean, he does say this at some point in part two of the discourse, actually, but by that time he must have changed what he means by the state of nature, because he can't answer, oh yeah, sovereigns are in the state of nature, right? Sovereigns are not in the state of nature as he describes it in part one of the discourse. They don't wake up every morning, find an oak tree, get some acorns, eat their fill, drink from the nearest stream, and then go to sleep under the oak tree. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, there's been some questions here that I didn't notice in the chat. I hope I didn't miss, no, I only missed a couple, okay. But don't people have property in state of nature according to Locke? I'm not sure what point you asked that, but I think maybe, so according to Locke, there can be property 
under the law of nature. So it's like, so to speak, natural for people to have property. Um, um, I mean, it's true that Locke also thinks that money can be invented in the state of nature. So that was, that was a kind of historical difference in Locke, right? The pre-money state of nature versus the post-money state of nature. It's the post-money state of nature in which the inequalities start to grow according to Locke. Um, yeah, I wish I understood better. I mean, unless the answer is just that Locke isn't thinking clearly, but people love to say that, say that about Locke, and I usually find in the end that it's not true, that they just don't understand what he's doing. But I wish I understood better what he's doing, why it seems to be so up in the air, whether he's... Why he seems to sometimes like be moving from this over to this. Um, but I mean, as we'll see, there's a similar question about, well, I already pointed out there's a similar question about Rousseau because sometime later in part two, he will say that sovereigns are in a state of nature. So, but in any case, at this point, he can't say sovereigns are in a state of nature. He can't even say things like people stranded on a desert island, you know, or in a state of nature or, um, um, Americans or Hottentots, uh, Hottentot, I guess, is now considered, um, um, so what I'm looking for, uh, <laughs> Hottentots is not is not something that those people actually like to be called. <laughs> um, so, but but in any case, they you know it's like uh, the non Bantu indigenous population of South Western Africa, I think, is who the Hottentots are. So, in any case, I mean, he can't even give those of, as examples of people in the state of nature because they're clearly not in the kind of state of nature he describes. Um, so, like, his history of the world basically implies that if people ever were in the state of nature, it must have been a very long time ago. There's no trace of them left. So, I mean, the people in the state of nature were people who didn't have tools, didn't have families, didn't have language, um, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know any people like that. We don't even know chimpanzees like that, although I don't think you know. Anyway, oh, oh I'm sorry, there was another question here that I missed. Um, not PC, yeah, that, but that's not the word I was looking for either. All right, but in any case, yeah, you shouldn't call them hot and tots. They don't like that. Um, so property would not be considered a nice thing in the state of nature. Oh, well, you know, so uh, yeah, according to Locke in the state of nature, we can have, yeah, we can have some property, but it's not sufficiently secure to allow civilization to build up, I think is Locke's position. And that's why even according to Locke, there are, aren't usually people living in a state of nature for very long. Um, uh, but, you know, he can give examples like people stranded on a desert island, like he's heard that in certain parts of North America, they at least sometime had no government at all. You know, I mean, uh, whereas Rousseau can't point to anything like that. Because those people obviously had tools and language and families and so forth. They weren't in Rousseau's state of nature. Um, so I guess, you know, the question is, um, so should we take this history of the world seriously? Is he actually hypothesizing that there was a time um, a long time ago when people lived the way he's describing? Well, so it's hard to say immediately there's a problem with trying to answer that question because the first thing he says about it is that, um, of course, we know because of the Bible that there never were people in a state of nature, right? 
Religion commands us to believe that since God himself drew men out of the state of nature, they are unequal because he wanted them to be so. Now, um, what he's doing by saying that, um, I'm not sure, but it's difficult to believe that what he's doing by saying that is giving his, his actual opinion. <laughs> Right. Uh, I mean, and it's, I think it would be even more difficult if you read what the Savoyard vicar says in Emile, which he's mostly thought to be a kind of spokesperson for Rousseau's religious views. Um, but it's difficult to believe, even if you look at what Rousseau himself says farther down the same page. Um, where he says he's going to imagine himself speaking to an audience of pagan philosophers in Athens. And, he, and this is how he begins his speech. Oh man, whatever country you may be from, whatever your opinions may be, listen, here is your history as I have thought to read it, not in the books of your fellow men who are liars, but in nature which never lies. Right. So, I mean, you have Rousseau against Rousseau, right? In one paragraph, he says, um, of course, this is all just hypothetical because as Christians, we're supposed to believe that, um, you know, it was God who took human beings out of the state of nature immediately. God taught them language, you know, um, uh, God started enforcing laws, you can't kill your brother, etc. right? Um, so, um, so therefore, just consider this all a kind of a hypothetical exercise. But then as soon as he starts the hypothetical exercise, the first thing he says is, I'm reading the book of nature, which never lies, unlike law books written by people, which lie. <laughs> Right. So, um, and he's saying this to you, whatever country you are from, right? He imagines himself outside of a Christian country in order to say this. <laughs> so, um, right. So exactly what's going on here is, um, I mean, the simple explanation would be that, uh, Due to censorship, he actually is speaking within his master's earshot. Um, and um, he's actually kind of warned you about that by bringing up that topic first. Um, but it may also be more complicated than that. Um, I mean, I think his, and if you read what the Savoyard Vicar says in Emil, you would realize that whatever his view about religion is, it's kind of complicated. <laughs> um, so in any case, I think, you know, um, what can we conclude from all of this? It's hard to say. The history is, I mean, it's not right. What do I mean when I say it's not right? I mean, like, his biology is not right, for example. It, um, you know, non-human animals don't live together the way he says they do. They live in social groups. They have power hierarchies. They defend territory, right? Um, so, um, you know... Um, if you really were to compare human beings to other animals and ask what they were like in the state of nature, you would probably want to say, you know, they were like baboons, they were like chimpanzees, right? I mean, um, assuming they're in a state of nature. Um, so, uh, um, and moreover, like when he gives, you know, a detailed especially in part two, when he's, he's going to give a detailed explanation of the order in which various things happened. So like archaeology doesn't back that up. It's not the right order, you know. Um, so if, 
a lot depends on how to, a lot about how seriously to take this depends on how to understand um, in exactly what way he means this history. On the one hand, he says, it's not really history at all. It doesn't, facts don't matter. I'm just considering a kind of, you know, hypothetical question. On the other hand, he um, uh, not only says that thing about books lying and nature not lying, but he also uh, seems to put a lot of effort into trying to figure out how things could have happened and how long they would have taken. And even apologizes for not considering what human beings were like before they had their present physical form, like when they were caught quadrupeds or whatever. <laughs> so, um, um, I think, but it's hard to be sure about this. I think the answer is. It's something like this must be the answer about Locke, too. That on the one hand, it's supposed to be possible that things happen this way, according to Rousseau. And it's important that they could have happened this way. And I guess maybe it's more that it's important that they would have happened this way if you imagine the starting conditions the way he does. Um, um, so that, I mean, actually this historic, this history is really, it is actually a form of this abstraction, but it's a special form of it because what he's asking is, um, something about what belongs to human beings, human beings as they actually are now, that's why this is abstraction, right? We're taking what everything we know about human beings, really, but we're like ignoring part of it, so to speak. And what we're ignoring is everything except like what kind of rational animal we are, <laughs> something like that. So, um, so that's why not only do we abstract from what we know about civilization, but we also abstract from certain things we know about non-human animals, like the way instincts or whatever allow them to live together. Um, so um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a fiction, but it's a, like a logical fiction, right? It's like, um, let's consider human beings only in some limited respect and ask what they would have done in what order and how they could have arrived at the where they are now from that. Now, I think that's what he's doing. Um, I mean, if that's right, in one sense, it's good news because it means that it doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter if the biblical story is true. <laughs> it wouldn't affect his claim, as he says. But it also doesn't matter if he's wrong about natural history, right? About, um, or about, you know, evolution, sociobiology, whatever, because that's, the, that also wouldn't affect the answer to, or wouldn't necessarily affect the answer to the question he's actually asking. However, um, so I said it's good news in one sense, but in another sense it's bad news because it makes it hard to understand why we're interested in this. <laughs> right? I mean, um, why precisely that abstraction are we interested in? Um, and I mean, my sense is it has something to do with um, with this piece, that what this answer is supposed to be relevant to is the question, should we be grateful that we're living in a civil society 
and fear the dissolution of civil society more than anything else, the way Hobbes says, or more than almost anything else, the way Locke says? Or should we look at the civil society we live in as kind of a big problem, <laughs> right? So, um, so, he's, so this particular abstraction is supposed to be, like it's a particular point of view from which to ask that question. The question is something like, um, granted that we still wanna be human beings, Right, we, the question isn't whether we would be happier if we were ants or antelopes or even chimpanzees, right? But granted that we still want to be human beings, how should we feel about the way we live now? We know it's not natural. Should we think it's better than nature and therefore be really concerned to preserve it? Or should we think it's worse than nature and therefore be really concerned to find a way out of it? Um, and I think that's also how I erased this, but remember there were two parts of the Academy's question, the origins of inequality and is it authorized? So I think um, from the way I just presented it, you can, you can see how, in, what in Rousseau's mind might be the connection between those two. Oh, I'm sorry, those are kind of off the top of the board. Oh, yes, yes, that is, that is, the banging sound is my daughter in the hallway pretending the, lot, the laundry baskets are horse jumps and she's a horse. <laughs> that's what that sound is. And that's what she does a lot of the day when she's not stuck in a Zoom call. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so... Uh, Right, and I'm sorry, this is kind of off the top of the board, but it says origins and authorization. Um, right, so the two questions are the origins of inequality and is it authorized by the law of nature? And so the way Rousseau is, is choosing to construe the connection between those questions is to say, well, so, you know, we're asked how could it be authorized by the law of nature? It would be authorized by the law of nature. Well, look, how is it authorized by the law of nature according to Hobbes? The law of nature authorizes it because the law of nature says seek peace because the state of war is, uh, the state of nature is a state of war of all against all and it's the most miserable possible. So the law of nature that says seek peace says don't be in the state of nature. <laughs> so if, and if that requires or gives rise to inequalities, then uh, they're authorized by the law of nature, according to Hobbes. And actually, he, if you go through the laws of nature, you'll see the point at which it's literally authorized, right? Like it says, um, or actually, it's actually, when you go through the, powers of the sovereign, the inseparable powers of the sovereign. You'll see that it's literally authorized because one of them is that the sovereign has the right to assign people to different ranks and another is that the sovereign has a right to distribute property in different ways. Um, so if it turns out that the state of nature, and again, now this isn't exactly, a his, it's not a point about true history, but it's a point about how history could go or would go or something like that. That, um, that if it turns out that um, the transition from a state of nature to the way we live now would be a loss rather than a gain, then the law of nature does, does not authorize doesn't necessarily authorize anything that's a prerequisite or a necessary consequence of the way we live now. Okay, are there questions about that? No, uh, someone said, go Margaret. No, this is Alana. Margaret's my older daughter. She does this sometimes, but not as much. She's already old enough that she doesn't bounce around as much. <laughs> it's, it's a sad fact that people and other animals move a lot when they're young and then they start moving less and less. <laughs> Actually, uh, Rousseau mentions this in the reading. 
He says, if you ask, well, won't old age be miserable for these people in the state of nature? He says, well, as they get older, they won't need to eat as much because they, <laughs> they won't move around as much. <laughs> so in proportion as they get weaker, they, they, they also won't have to do as much food gathering and it will kind of work out. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, do you repeat the last point that you made about the like authorization of nature? Oh, right. So the point I was making was that, you know, if the question if the question is does the law of nature authorize inequality? So, you know, look at how Hobbes gives the yes answer to that. He says, "Well, the law of nature tells you to seek peace and this because war of all against all is miserable and the state of nature is war of all against all so the law of nature tells you to leave the state of nature and enter the civil state and um and it's part of the civil state that um, someone is going to have the power of assigning different ranks and so forth so it's like it's an inevitable consequence of doing what the law of nature tells you to do that there will be political or moral inequality and therefore, according to Hobbes, the law of nature authorizes, in that sense, it authorizes political or moral inequality. And I'm saying, that on the other hand, that Rousseau, if, if Rousseau can say, look, the state of nature would be a contented and peaceful state, and although maybe not the best possible state, certainly better than the one we're in, then uh, the law of nature... Um, the law that tells you to seek your own preservation and, you know, your own interests or whatever will not authorize the things that we need to do to have our state, our civil state. And right among those is inequality. Did, did that help? I don't yeah, remember who asked the question. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Help. So, um, It didn't I understand help what you. you were saying about I don't understand what your point was about Hobbes, uh, but I'm not I'm not understanding your point about Rousseau. Maybe I'm putting it in too complicated a way. Just say you know, in in Hobbes, it was the fact that the state of nature was the worst state you could be in, and and definitely worse than any civil state. Um, that was what authorized inequality. Do you you follow that part right? So if Rousseau comes along and says, no, the state of nature is not so bad, actually, then it will no longer authorize inequality. Or it won't necessarily, anyway, right? I mean, that is, uh, it, it may well turn out that inequality, I mean, inequality uh, is certainly bad, at least for, certainly very bad for some people. But I think Rousseau thinks it's bad for everyone, actually. Right, that like inequality in wealth is bad for the rich as well as for the poor. Um, so um, yeah, inequality is something bad. And what do you get for inequality? You get a worse state than you were in to begin with. So it's not authorized. Did that? Yeah, that makes more sense. But I, how does he hold that opinion if he doesn't believe that a state of nature is like if it's a historical period well that's what i'm saying like if the question is really focused on how we should think about the way we live now then the question is like okay think of ourselves as human beings trying to decide whether we should be trying our best to preserve our current status or trying to find a way out of it um, I mean, and this is the kind of thing that makes people say that Rousseau sparked the French Revolution, right? So, like, is, even though, of course, the result of French Revolution was not, like, uh, a beautiful, peaceful state of nature, right? But, um, so, but uh, you know, some of the people involved thought it would be, maybe, right? So, like, um, um, if the focus is on, is really about how we should think about the civil society we find ourselves in. 
then the, the historical comparison is really just a way of ask of getting us to focus on like what about us is constant we can't get out of it distinguish it from everything else and see like is everything else something we like or not um, and the way of doing that is to tell this, which, as I said, I think Rousseau, I think Rousseau thinks, and maybe it's important for him to think that it, this could have really been a historical development. Maybe it really even was, right? Um, but um, but uh, what's important about it is like the ability to tell the story that allows you to see that everything else is really added to human being as like a featherless rational biped <laughs> is how you could describe the, this this um uh and rational mostly in the sense of practical reason of being able to choose what to do for a reason um uh that's how you could describe the, you know the 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 human being in the state of nature that rousseau is imagining doesn't have any other characteristics like for example it doesn't have a you know instinct to defend territory or uh, you know an instinct to live in a pack or something like that um, I don't know if that still doesn't help I don't know what else to say about it unless you can ask another question um, I think I'm starting to understand it a little bit more Okay. <laughs> you just I have some confusing ideas. Yeah, I mean, I don't claim that this is completely worked out either. So, like, you know, there's only so far you could go in understanding it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make some sense of what Rousseau is doing as best I can. Um, Professor. Yes. Is, so is he saying that like the state of nature is more chill? <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah, he doesn't use the term chill, but I guess, yeah, that would be one way of describing it. Yeah, it's like he says in the state of nature. I mean, again, this is partly something Locke goes some distance in this direction, right? But he says, um, oh, and someone asked about Diogenes. Yes, that was Diogenes. Um, Diogenes the cynic. Um, sorry, um, you know, he says, yeah, in the state of nature, well, I mean, actually, men, let me start talking about what I was going to talk about next, because I think that will actually come right to this question about why it was chill, <laughs> right? So, um, um, you know, it's, um, however you can account for it, this way of reframing the question is somehow behind like a lot of his criticisms of his predecessors. So in a way that's kind of unfair, right? Because he's sort of changing the topic and then criticizing them for not answering his question. But, um, but it could be fair if he thinks they're asking the wrong question. Right. I mean, because let's say ultimately all three of them are really interested in this question. Does the law of nature authorize political or moral inequality? And if so, how much? Um, and in what case and so forth. Right. So in any case, um, basically, you know, I mean, this so the criticism i think especially by hobbes wouldn't be accepted but the criticism is is something like um well in a nutshell the, the as as he puts it you know these philosophers have tried to imagine the state of nature but they couldn't imagine it and instead they imagined citizens in a st in the state of nature Right, so the, the, the people they are thinking about in the state of nature are thinking and doing things that um, you would only be able to think or have any reason to do after civilization or at least some kind of society had already arisen. So, I mean, um, 
so, uh, you know, um, well, I guess uh, one aspect of this is um, that um, people in the state of nature wouldn't have all kinds of concepts that we have like justice, belonging, authority, government, um, avarice, oppression, pride, right? Um, um, Rousseau claims that those are all difficult concepts to form and, um, and moreover, they're concepts that are, you are, can really only be formed if there's already a society of some kind in place, right? So like, uh, in order to think about justice and injustice, you have to have regular transactions with people at a minimum, right? Like you have to depend on them to do things or depend on them for things you need and vice versa and the same people over and over. You have to know individuals um, and remember what they've done and all kinds of stuff like that. Whereas Rousseau claims that in the state of nature, um, people would be much more solitary than even Hobbes imagines them being. They would rarely see each other. <laughs> Um, the children would stay with the mother only until they were able to find food for themselves and then they would go off looking for food and they wouldn't be even be able to find their way back if they wanted to, <laughs> right? Or I mean, they might be able to find their way back to that same place, but by that time the mother would have wandered on. <laughs> so, um, so uh, there wouldn't be, they wouldn't have transactions with each other. They wouldn't be trying to take each, other, each other's stuff. At least not as a rule, right? Not enough that they would form concepts to describe it. They would only, um, um, well, the way he puts it, this is on page 64. Oh yeah, so Vanessa says, so there would be no families or relationships in the state of nature, according to Rousseau. Yes, exactly. Right? Because, you know, he's saying that those things either are or are byproducts of um, conventions among human beings by which they live together and regularly carry out transactions with each other. In the state of nature, they would, you know, I mean, uh, he doesn't explain how they would do this, but uh, the males and females would find each other sometimes, presumably, <laughs> um, in order to reproduce, and, but then they would, like, separate again. Because they wouldn't expect any help or need any help from each other. And, you know, that's, that's so... Um, um, that's another aspect. So, okay, one aspect to why the state of nature would be chill, therefore, is that Rousseau says um, they wouldn't be afraid of all kinds of things that we're afraid of because they wouldn't even think of them. They wouldn't even have the, the concepts to think of them. You know, like, what if everyone else gangs up on me and takes my stuff? It would never occur to them that, that people might gang up with each other to do something. <laughs> um, and more than that, he says, you know, actually, I'm not sure in what order to put these things, but I guess, I guess maybe you should say this about Rousseau's state of nature. Even more than Locke's state of nature, it's a state of plenty. The forests haven't been chopped down yet. Um, the animals haven't been hunted yet. There's not very many people. It's easy to find food, Rousseau says. Just eat some acorns. Now, actually, I don't think you can eat acorns, really, without preparing them pretty carefully. I don't think that's realistic. 
But maybe there's other kinds of stuff you could, nuts or something you could eat. I don't know what the wild ancestors of domesticated nut species were like. But uh, ground nuts. Yeah, I don't know. So, but in any case, according to uh, Rousseau, food was everywhere. Um, it didn't take a lot of effort to get it. It didn't, you didn't need help to get it. And so, um, and moreover, you wouldn't really think of asking for help to get it. <laughs> so, uh, um, um, number one, you wouldn't be thinking about associating with other people. But number two, also, you wouldn't be thinking ahead to the future very much. Because you wouldn't have to. Right? Like, you know, uh, um, if you can be sure that when you wake up tomorrow, you'll be able to find an oak tree and eat some acorns. Because oak trees don't have acorns all year long, but all right. But anyway, if you, if you think that when you wake up tomorrow, you're going to be able to go out and find some acorns or like kill a rabbit and eat it, well, I guess, with your hands, <laughs> then uh, um, then you're not thinking about like, okay, what should I plan for next month or something? You don't need a plan. So... Um, so when you put all that together, the state of nature is very chill <laughs> because um, uh, um, you're not worried about anything, basically. Bad things can happen to you, but you're not worried about them because you don't really know enough to worry about them. <laughs> um, and once they happen, if they don't kill you, you recover and you kind of forget about it. And that includes if another human being should happen to come across your path and take your acorns. Um, uh, this is the part I was going to read. This is on page 64, my edition at least. Um, um, they regarded the acts of violence that could befall them as an easily redressed evil and not as an offense that must be punished. Right? So if someone did come along and take your acorns, instead of thinking, uh-oh, if, you know, if people are allowed to just take each other's acorns, then, you know, no one's going to have acorns anymore and we got to do something about this. Make sure, you know to uh, give this person a disincentive so they won't do it again and other people won't follow their example, uh, you, you, you don't even have all of those concepts. Disincentive, example, you know, um, what will happen if everyone does this? You're not even thinking that way. All you think is, uh-oh, I need more acorns. <laughs> right? That's what he means by saying it's... it's uh, an easily redressed evil. I think evil here means not moral evil, but just like a bad thing. It's like a bad thing that happened to you, but it's easy to fix. Just go to the next acorn tree. Okay, now I have acorns again. Um, and um, even more than that, of course, the state of nature is not... Um, a state where you can even wish that you have all these nice things. Oops, I never switched back to that. Okay. It's not a state where you can even wish that you had all those nice things. Right? I mean, you're not going to start thinking, boy, if only I could plant wheat and, you know, and plow and, you know, all those things. Um, on the contrary, as Rousseau puts it, it's really hard to understand how anyone first had that idea. There's so many steps you have to do right, and and moreover, as he keeps saying, like um, originally in the state of nature, when the population was sparse and the forests weren't cut down and whatever, they, they couldn't be cut down because they didn't have axes, right? So, like... 
um, you wouldn't get more food by doing this agriculture thing. You already have enough food. So like someone has to, at some point, like get this complicated idea to do all these steps one after another. And um, um, no one in a state of nature is going to be wishing they could do that. Right? The question is, is rather how anyone first got the idea to do it. So um, no one's going to be wishing they had a, they had a house. They don't, they've never seen a house. They don't know what a house is. <laughs> it's not gonna occur to them to wish they had a house. They're just gonna lie down under the oak tree that they just got their acorns from and go to sleep. <laughs> and if you say, well, won't they be cold? Won't they be wet? Rousseau says, well, you know, those things bother us because we spend all our times indoors and, you know, and are all, like coddled by civilization. But if we were living in a state of nature, we would be healthy and robust just like all the other animals are, and we wouldn't need to worry about that. There again, right, I mean, a lot, there are lots of animals that don't just sleep out in the open, or that certainly don't want to, right? <laughs> but, uh, um, and moreover, I mean, if animals see a house, as I know all too well as an owner of a house, they pretty quickly get the idea that it might be nice to move in. <laughs> there <laughs> but uh, um, but anyway um, um, again this is Rousseau's description of what the state of nature would be like and again like maybe maybe it's true according to the kind of abstraction he's trying he's asking us to carry out even if even though it's not true of any of our human or pre-human ancestors let's say um, so, um, right, so, so that makes the state of nature very chill. Um, and, um, sorry, so there are a couple of comments in the chat that I didn't pay attention to. That sounds like a lonely, sad way to live. Well, you know, Rousseau is going to say, we would be lonely. Right? If you deprived us of human companionship, we would be lonely. But uh, these people aren't lonely. Um, uh, you know, um, are wild animals lonely? Well, okay. So, I mean, a lot of social animals would get uh, do get very lonely on their own but the kind of wild animal he's imagining <laughs> that doesn't have those social instincts or whatever would they be lonely no right because they, they don't want it, it, in it in it like in a nutshell the reason the the reason the state of nature is not bad is that um people don't know that they could have anything else so they don't miss the, that it's not there. I mean, that's like both like directly makes it not bad because it means that, you know, the fact that they don't live with other people, that they don't live in a house, that they don't have tools, that they don't cook their meat, etc., and that they don't have language <laughs> doesn't make them um, unhappy because you can't be unhappy of something you can't even conceive of, about missing something that you can't even conceive of. Um, but it also indirectly makes it not so bad because it means that the kind of thoughts that occur in Hobbes's state of nature of like, I better get more and more stuff because, you know, otherwise someone else will get it and then they'll be more powerful than me and they'll attack and whatever. Like, all of that is stuff that um, wouldn't occur to anyone. And because it wouldn't occur to anyone, it's not true, <laughs> right? Like, it's a problem that takes care of itself, essentially. Um, um, so, like, if, um, if, if you look at Hobbes' two reasons for leaving the state of nature, this one is completely crossed out, according to Rousseau. 
And what about the constant fear of violent death? Well, I mean, for one thing, like I said, the fear of being attacked by other human beings is, you know, I mean, yeah, you know it might happen, just like you know it might be attacked by a wolf or a bear or whatever, but, uh, you know, there's no particular reason to think it's going to happen a lot. <laughs> and if it happens, you'll defend yourself, right? But, um, but actually, Rousseau says something even more than that. I'm not going to find this in a book because I'm out of time. But he says, um, actually, the worst that people can fear in this state is being hurt, being wounded. They can't fear death because um, they have no concept of death. He doesn't really prove that, but he just says, you know, no animal ever knew what it was to die. No mere animal knew what it was to die. So the constant fear of, of violent death that Hobbes says is a reason to stay, leave the state of nature, just again, just doesn't occur. So, I mean, by this time, of course, on the one hand, Rousseau has portrayed the state of nature as pretty chill and not that bad. But on the other hand, he's made it harder and harder to understand how anyone ever left the state of nature. So he's going to have his work cut out for him, trying to explain that in part two. And I'll uh, talk about that next week. Yeah? I have a quick question. So is this kind of why Rousseau would believe that there was only one state of nature? Because if people keep coming in and out of commonwealths, they would have this like knowledge of what all of those complex ideas are. And then in that case, it would kind of transform more into Hobbes' idea of, like, the state of nature of, like, yeah. fearing things. Yeah, that's, I mean, that basically is where Rousseau thinks Hobbes gets his idea about the state of nature. And it's accurate enough, right? I mean, where does Hobbes get his idea of state of nature most strongly? From the English Civil War, <laughs> right? It's from people having left the civil state. But with all those tools and ideas and everything, um, I guess I will say one other thing, which is that um, when you ask, as I was asking before, according to Rousseau, shouldn't we try to get out of this state? I think the answer will be yes, but we can't do it by going back to the state of nature. That's not right because for the reason you just said, they would have to be. We would have to do something else. Rousseau doesn't say what. Okay, sorry, I'm over time, or else I would talk about that more. Uh, I'll see you all next week. Bye.